Commissioner Cagle? Here. Commissioner Manville? Here. Commissioner Parent? Here. Commissioner Sloan? Uh, Vice Chair Stedstrap? Here. And um, Winnie Wexler, here. And um, I'll just go back to make sure, is Commissioner Aiken here or Commissioner Sloan? Okay. Well, thanks everyone for um, from being here with us tonight. Um, uh, we're going to uh, just go over a few housekeeping issues. Um, uh, this meeting is being recorded and will be posted. Uh, captions are going to be provided um, to, enable, to enable closed captions. Click on the closed caption icon, CC, at the bottom of the screen. There's also ASL interpretation being offered, as well as simultaneous interpretation into Spanish. And in order to access the Spanish channel, if everyone will just do this together, um, bring your cursor down to the bottom of the screen and under interpretation, um, click on the globe icon at the bottom of the screen, screen and so please select your preferred language channel and everyone is supposed to do this, English or Spanish. So hey, buenas noches a todos. El, para poder escoger el idioma español para la interpretación, so por favor. I just, I just clicked on English. And everyone else, please um, choose either English or, or Spanish. Muy bien. Para las personas en español, les pedimos, por okay, favor, thank you que so pre much. presionen el um, botón de español, el canal en español, en el Globo Terráqueo. Gracias. Just want to double check to see if any, if any other commissioners have joined us. If not, uh, let's just move right into the agenda. Uh, first item is uh, the first of a two-part presentation, the second part being um, at our next regular meeting on March 20, uh, Monday, March 28th. Uh, this is a two-part presentation by city staff on the City of Santa Monica's upcoming Human Services Grant Program uh, and their draft request for proposal, or RFP, for uh, the next round of proposals for, that will be um, issued for fiscal years 2023 through 2027. We're going to have staff presentation by Elizabeth um, Cherie and Alana Riemerman from the Housing and Human Services Division for the city. And so um, looking forward to that presentation. Uh, for those of you who received the agenda and for those of you who, who want to see what the agenda is and the attachments, they were all posted on the um, City of Santa Monica Social Services Commission's website. So um, Liz and Alana. Yes, thank you, Chair Wessler. I'm gonna kick it off. I'm gonna share my screen so that everyone can follow along with my presentation. All right, thumbs up. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, okay, great. All right, well, good evening. Uh, as Winnie said, I'm Liz Cherie. I'm a senior analyst in the Housing and Human Services Division. And I'm here tonight with Alana to present a portion of the upcoming request for proposal um, for the next Human Services Grants Program funding cycle. In this presentation, we are going to provide an overview of the Human Services Grants Program, also referred to as HSGP, describe the RFP, RFP process and provide details about the following RFP components for community input tonight. We're gonna to talk about eligibility criteria for prospective agencies, eligibility criteria for the program participants agencies proposed to serve, and the scoring criteria of the application. We'll review the next steps and timeline for this RFP, including a presentation on the draft outcomes at your next meeting on March 28th. And lastly, we will provide details and a timeline for how members of the public can learn more about this draft RFP and provide input on the key components that we will be presenting tonight and at this meeting next month. The agenda, as Winnie said, the agenda with relevant uh, materials to reference can be found at www.smgov.net slash SSC. And we ask that you please hold any questions or comments until the end of our presentation. So the Human Services Grants Program provides high quality, easily accessible and culturally competent social services to eligible participants. 
The program has been operating for nearly 50 years, is currently funding 19 agencies and 35 distinct programs, serving approximately 30,000 residents annually and operating with an $8 million budget. The grant cycle is a multi-year cycle in order to provide funding stability for programs and their clients. Consistent with our current HSGP priorities, this RFP will seek agencies and programs that support the city's vulnerable, low-income residents, including but not limited to youth and their families, seniors, people with disabilities, and people experiencing homelessness. Our current HSGP grant cycle will end in June 2023, and the draft RFP being presented tonight is for procurement of contracts for a 2023 through 2027 grant cycle. The final funding amount for this new cycle will be determined by City Council as part of the biannual budget process. An RFP is a transparent, competitive process of awarding funds to organizations. We've outlined some key expectations that applying agencies should be prepared to meet, as well as focus areas and priorities that are new to this RFP. The agencies that apply are expected to propose programs that are evidence-based and data-driven. We value agencies that take a collaborative and coordinated approach to service delivery, working within a system of care to ensure that the whole person is being served and making appropriate referrals to connecting with colleagues to collaborate on community social, uh, social issues for policy development. We expect programs to demonstrate high impact on the individual and thus the community. And we expect that the applying agencies operate with a person-centered approach to service delivery. An area of focus in this RFP includes a demonstrated responsiveness to the pandemic. We wanna know that the proposed services will be delivered in an adaptive way to account for the barriers and impacts of COVID-19. For example, responding to increased mental health challenges, access to services, et cetera. We're also standardizing outcomes across all programs in an effort to demonstrate the impact of services across disciplines and populations. We're emphasizing a renewed commitment to equity, asking agencies to demonstrate their policies and practices related to, related to promoting equity within their organizations and also within their work. And this draft RFP aims to encourage new agencies and new programs to apply for funds, removing barriers that may have dissuaded agencies from applying in the past. I will now introduce Alana to walk you through some key components of the draft RFP that we are presenting to you tonight. Thanks, Liz. I'm just double checking that everyone can hear me before I get started. Yes, we can hear you. Great, thanks. Um, as Liz mentioned, my name is Alana Reimerman, and I'm a Senior Human Services Analyst in the Housing and Human Services Division. Work alongside Liz. Thanks for having us here tonight. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to make sure that um, everyone understands the two stages of review for the Human Services Grants Program RFP. And first is to make sure that agencies are eligible for the program. And next is to score eligible application proposals that we receive. Um, I'm going to start by walking you through the proposed eligibility criteria for agencies applying for human services grants program funding, but also proposed eligibility criteria for program participants. And as Liz, as Liz mentioned, I'm going to end with a review of our draft application scoring criteria. And we will be returning in March to discuss outcomes. So that will be coming up next month. I'm going to kick us off by reviewing our draft agency eligibility criteria, and you can refer to attachment A of the agenda packet, which will have the full list of criteria and is posted on the Social Services Commission website at www.smgov.net slash SSC. Agencies must be a nonprofit with a minimum of 12 board members, and this is the majority of our current grantees, or hospitals or educational institutions with governing boards. And agencies must demonstrate their financial stability and sufficiency by submitting, submitting audited financial statements and monitoring reports. And agencies must be currently located or co-located in Santa Monica. Or for agencies not currently located within the city, they must describe their planned service delivery model and submit supporting documentation of how they plan to locate themselves within the city. For example, through a letter of agreement, a lease, or an MOU. It's important that agencies have both a physical and programmatic presence in Santa Monica so that services are accessible to the target population and meet a local need. 
In previous rounds of the Human Services Grants Program, funds were only available to agencies that were already operating within the city. So this round, in response to community feedback, we are proposing to expand eligibility to agencies that are not currently operating in Santa Monica, but have a viable plan to do so. We also recommend that the additional administrative requirements listed on the slide be included in Human Services Grants Program agency eligibility. And again, you can find that full list in attachment A of the agenda packet. Next, I'm gonna share our proposed criteria for eligible program participants. And you can refer to attachment B of the agenda packet for the full list of, of eligibility criteria for program participants. For context, it's helpful to know that the programs currently funded under the Human Services Grants Program also receive funding from other sources and serve lots of individuals who may or may not live or work in Santa Monica. So we have these criteria in place to ensure city funds are serving the local community. To be clear, these criteria only apply to people who can be served using city human services grants program funds. And we call these Santa Monica Program Participants or SMPP, which is a term you may have heard. Categories, the proposed categories include individuals or households with a permanent address in Santa Monica, or students enrolled in a Santa Monica public school, or youth aged 16 to 25 previously enrolled in a Santa Monica public school with continued ties in the city and with accompanying risk factors. Next, I'm gonna re review our proposed participant eligibility for people experiencing homelessness. As you can imagine, human services grants program funds are insufficient to serve every person who is experiencing homelessness within the city. Most homeless programs operating within the city are largely funded by county departments and the LA Homeless, homeless Services Authority or LASA, as most people call it, and therefore serve people from the larger region. The city adopted these criteria in 2008 as a mechanism to prioritize a portion of these services for local needs and priorities. These criteria ensure that the city prioritizes services for the, most, the people most likely to die on the streets without intervention, people generating the most calls to fire and police, and people who became homeless in Santa Monica. The specific criteria include people experiencing homelessness whose last permanent address was in Santa Monica, or people who have been homeless in Santa Monica for five years or more, or people employed in Santa Monica or with someone in a household who is employed in Santa Monica who is experiencing homelessness, or people connected to the Santa Monica Service Registry. And for those who don't know, the Santa Monica Service Reg Registry is a by name list of the city's most vulnerable homeless individuals and is used to prioritize resources for those with the, who have significant barriers to services and housing and require the most public resources. And this category also includes homeless individuals who have been identified by staff as high users of city services. And one small exception to the, but these criteria is that street-based engagement or outreach teams operating within the city boundaries are expected to provide services to participants regardless of program participant status. However, these individuals would not automatically be considered eligible for other city-funded services. Because of the limited resources we talked about earlier, we propose that a homeless person or family who recently arrived in Santa Monica or who only occasionally stays in Santa Monica would not be considered an eligible SMPP. Any person experiencing homelessness who does not fall into one of these categories above would instead be served by county or other regional resources. Next, I'm gonna to transition to our draft criteria for scoring applications. A complete application consists of a program plan, a program budget, and supporting documentation. The program plan outlines what the program will look like, such as a description of the services and target population, and the program budget lists all anticipated expenses for the program. We will also ask for some additional supporting documentation to assess the agency's financial stability and sufficiency. Next, I'm gonna walk you through how we propose to score in these areas. After agencies are determined to be eligible and submit an application, the application is then scored 
and the scoring criteria will be laid out clearly in the RFP. We tried to make the scoring process very transparent by attaching each, each section of the program plan and budget with a clear point allocation. First, I'll, I'll review our proposed scoring criteria for the program plan. And please see attachment C of the agenda packet for the full scoring rubric. In the program summary section, we ask for a description of the target population and the services to be provided, and we are recommending 30 points be allocated to the section. Here we are looking to see the program is serving a population relevant to the community, and the services are ad addressing an identified local need. We want to know how the program is leveraging best practices and how it promotes equity. We also want to make sure that the programs are accessible to the target population, partic particularly under the limitations of the pandemic. We are recommending 30 points be allocated to the organizational capacity policies and procedures section. Here, here we are looking at the agency's organizational capacity. We want to see that they have a track record of providing high impact fiscally sound services. This is an area where we'll be able to review past monitoring reports. We also want to make sure that they have adequate staffing in place in order to effectively implement the proposed program. We also ask about their organizational policies and procedures to assure that they address equity for staff and participants, including professional development and opportunities for program participants to inform program design. As stated earlier when Liz discussed the program's priorities and focus, we expect agencies to align with the city's commitment to equity. In this section, we're also asking about the partnerships that the agency brings to the table. Here we want to make sure the agency is integrated within its system of care and that the agency has cultivated partnerships locally, but especially within the city. Agencies shouldn't be operating within a vacuum, so we want to make sure they have a collaborative approach and are able to effectively partner with the city. In the program outcomes section, we are asking about their proposed program outcomes and what impact the applicants hope to achieve as a result of their programs. We are recommending 40 points be allocated to the section. Here we want to make sure they have clearly identified outcomes and a plan to collect data and measure progress. As we discussed earlier, our division will be returning to this body again in March to discuss program outcomes in greater detail. Next, I'll pivot to our proposed fiscal scoring. And you can see attachment D for the full scoring rubric. In addition to the, um, the program plan that I mentioned earlier, applicants must submit a program budget that outlines all anticipated expenses associated with the program. We are recommending 30 points be allocated to this section. When reviewing the budget, we are looking to see if their overall costs are reasonable, including the percent going to administrative expenses, that salaries are adequate, and that they are sufficiently leveraging non-city funds. We will also ask the applicants to submit audited financial statements for the three most recently completed consecutive fiscal years. We are recommending 10 points be allocated to this section. The main thing we are looking for here is to see if they have any outstanding findings or concerns. In order to assess historical financial performance, we will review the agency's most recent monitoring reports. For current Human Services Grant Program grantees, we will look at their performance within the program, and for new agencies, we will ask for reports from their largest funder. We will look at things like spend down issues, returned funds, cash match, or other fiscal related findings. And we are recommending 10 points be allocated to the section. In terms of process, after we receive the applications, an independent review panel will review proposals using objective scoring criteria and will make award recommendations accordingly. In the past, proposals have been scored by a diverse group of subject matter experts, community stakeholders, and city staff. For this cycle, we are proposing a more public process for the selection and identification of these panelists. So we will return to the community at a later date to discuss recommendations for this process. At this point, I'll hand it back to Liz to discuss the next steps. Thanks, Alana. So over the next several months, we will continue to finalize this RFP, seeking input and feedback from the community, including returning to this body on March 28th to present the draft outcome section of the RFP. The community input process will close on May 2nd, allowing us time to incorporate feedback and present um, the RFP to City Council this summer and publish it in the fall. 
The RFP will be open for three months and the selection panel will have a month to review the applications and make award recommendations to city staff. These recommendations will be presented to city council in the spring of 2023 and formal awards will be made in June 2023 with the new grant cycle beginning in July. So we are seeking input on the draft uh, RFP components that have been shared in our presentation and we welcome general feedback on anything presented tonight, but we are specifically seeking your input on these three key questions. Uh, regarding applicant eligibility, these criteria have historically focused on identifying well-established nonprofit agencies with a documented track record of fiscal and programmatic performance. And we want your feedback on whether there should be a carve out of smaller grants with a separate or less stringent set of criteria for newly formed startup nonprofits who do not meet the existing proposed criteria. And keep in mind that we do not have extra funding. So these grants would need to be funded out of the larger pot of funding. And you can reference attachment A of our draft uh, agency eligibility criteria. And regarding the participant eligibility, tonight we presented our division's proposed eligibility criteria for SMPP. Based on your knowledge of the community, are there any vulnerable populations that should be included that do not fall into one of the proposed categories? And you can reference attachment B of our draft participant eligibility criteria. And lastly, the scoring criteria. The scoring criteria are critical in determining which proposals are recommended for funding and which aren't. We are seeking input on whether the proposed point allocations we presented tonight are weighed appropriately to reflect the values and priorities we are seeking to fund. If you have additional feedback after tonight, feedback and questions can be submitted by email or by written comment to the addresses listed on the slide. And as mentioned earlier, the community input process will be open until May 2nd. These draft RFP documents are available for review at santamonica.gov slash human services grants program.com and a link to the recording of this presentation can be found at smgov.net slash ssc. And that concludes our presentation, so I will pass it back to the chair. Thanks so much to both of you. Um, first, I wanted to just see if um, there's any public comment from uh, anyone who's participating. I see a question from Bianca Smith. Oh, thank you so much. Um, excuse, um, I'm sorry, before you start, um, can someone, can one of the commissioners uh, take a three minute uh, time this for three minutes? I don't know. Uh, yeah, Vice, I'll do it. Vice Chair, thank you so much. Okay, three minutes for, for each public comment. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Bianca. I'm the Assistant Vice President of Program Operations at Chrysalis. Since opening our Santa Monica office in 94, we have worked closely with the City of Santa Monica, including receiving funding through the Human Services Grants Program in order to serve vulnerable members of our community, including individuals experiencing homelessness, those impacted by the criminal justice system, as well as lower income members of the Santa Monica community looking for work. We have also worked very closely with the network of service providers and city staff in Santa Monica, in large part due to the openness, innovation, and a collaborative culture that has been set by the city staff and its leadership. First, we wanted to comment that we encourage the Social Services Commission, the Housing and Human Services Department, and the Council to continue to fund employment services for the most vulnerable in our community. Without that funding, those in our community who are looking for work for support and finding and keeping a job will be left without assistance and even less stable. In a time when we need to focus on taking steps to prevent our neighbors from slipping into homelessness due to the lack of employment and other factors, we need to be sure funding is there for employment. Second, we encourage the Social Services Commission, the Housing and Human Services Department and the Council to consider perhaps only for programs serving adults through employment, not with housing resources, a broadening of the eligibility criteria in the coming RFP. Currently, the Santa Monica program participants definition means that some members of the community do not count towards the grant funding targets. We might suggest the creation of a new SMPP subcategory that adds a slight expansion to include individuals experiencing homelessness in Santa Monica for any period of time, individuals staying in transitional housing or other programmatic temporary housing in the city of Santa Monica, individuals staying with family or friends, including couch surfing, as it's sometimes called. Exhibit B and the draft SMPP definition states, for programs proposing to serve youth aged 16 to 25, 
a certain criteria applies. And it also states for programs proposing to serve households experiencing homelessness, another criteria applies. We are suggesting adding this slightly broader category for programs proposing to serve working age adults with non-housing services, such as employment, the following criteria applies. This idea is to mirror the language and framework used for programs serving youth and or individuals experiencing homelessness. This would allow the city to retain a focus and have a prioritization of resources on those meeting the SMPP definition for housing resources and not change that definition, but slightly broaden it for other non-housing services like employment. Those in this proposed SMPP category are members of the community living in the city of Santa Monica, shopping at our businesses, taking city buses, and meeting the common notion of residing in, Santa, in the city in terms of where they slept the night before. Helping those residents find and keep a job will benefit all members of the Santa Monica community. Doing so fits into the overall objective of the Human Services Grants Program. And especially as, a bus as businesses are looking for workers and those in the homeless service sector are concerned about people falling into homelessness and becoming the future long-term homeless. I'm this sorry, is time is up. That's sorry. okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, uh, is there anyone else uh, who's on the phone who wants to uh, make a comment? Okay, well then we'll go um, uh, around. We, why don't we just go alphabetically um, by commissioners? And if, if, as, if, as a commissioner, if you don't have any questions or comments, uh, you can just pass. Um, I do believe we've been joined um, since we took role by Commissioner Aiken. Um, yes, I'm here. I'm going to pass at this point. Okay. Um, Commissioner Ambers. Uh, I just had a question about the uh, five year um, requirement that those that are homeless must be unhoused in Santa Monica for five years. I'm just wondering what the thought process is on uh, waiting the five years. Thanks for that question. Um, I'll respond briefly and then I'll see if um, Meg, Maggie Willis, the administrator um, working in our, in our unit would like to add. Um, but I believe there was this analysis done for how to target homeless resources to the people who are the most vulnerable. And it was um, found that the people who have been living in Santa Monica for five years um, were the most vulnerable and also had the strongest ties to the city of Santa Monica. Um, but I'll, I'll hand it to Maggie to see if she has anything more specific that she would want to add um, to that response. Good evening, commissioners. Thanks for the question. Yeah, this is Maggie Willis, the um, Housing and Human Services Administrator for the city. And Alana is exactly right. When we, um, we've had this criteria in place now uh, since 2008, um, and the idea was that there were people who had been chronically homeless in Santa Monica for many, many, many years who were not the people who were voluntarily walking into the service provider agencies and asking for help. Uh, they were people who had multiple barriers, uh, who couldn't keep appointments, who were not organized enough uh, in their thinking um, to be able to navigate a very complex system of care. And so what we wanted to do was sort of turn the homeless service system on its head and focus on the very people that were being left out of the system. And so that's why we have this very long sort of uh, requirement for being able to focus our very limited resources on the people that have been here the longest, um, not the folks that are just coming into Santa Monica and have been here uh, a week or six months um, who have come from other places. Okay, great. Any, any further questions, uh, Commissioner Ambers? Commissioner Cagle? Yes, hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, I was just curious what the um, what the rate is that you're accepting people and how about how many people you have to turn away for the participants. 
That's a Sorry, great question. Do you mean? Oh, go ahead, Liz. No, I think I think the question is how many how many applications are we expecting, and with our funding, how many yes. agencies are we? So currently, okay. yeah, we're our current funding allocation is for um, thirty five distinct programs, and that was when we released the RFP that we're in now. Um, I think it's we don't have an exact calculation of what we expect in this upcoming cycle. Um, if it, uh, as themes have changed over the last several years, we might see emerging, you know, organizations targeting emerging needs in mental health, um, in homelessness. So we don't have an exact calculation predicting how many organizations or distinct programs we think will apply. Um, we do have the same funding allocation as our last grant cycle. So um, I, and I can't speak specifically, and we can perhaps return to you with this information at the next meeting. I don't know how many um, agencies applied in our last cycle, but that's information that we can come back to you with uh, next time. Yes, I, I would be curious how many applied and were rejected on yeah. top of the ones that were mm -hmm. accepted. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Good question. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Mandel? Um, thank you very much for that lovely presentation. It was awesome, but I'd like to pass right now. Uh, Commissioner Parent. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, and, and having sort of the discussion questions and, and, and thinking about them. Um, th thank you for that. And, and I'm kind of going to go um, to, to go back to this. The, the, the question of eligibility, and um, you know, this has always been a little bit controversial, and I don't pretend to have another answer. But it's it's not it's it's easy to say, you know, the person who's here for two weeks or three or four weeks, um, but to get all the way to five years, is always a very difficult thing. Um, is there a, has there been is there any kind of analysis if it were four years, if it were three and a half years? I mean, I'm. I'm obviously talking to something we've all been concerned about. We share the concerns that you know people are on the streets, getting worse and worse, and and you know more and more service resistant uh, before they're eligible for service. Um, so I, that, that's so the evaluation of that five years. What would what would what would happen um, in our transitional housing? Do you think if this were four years? And it's also, by the way, people. And this is the terrible thing: people who are, you know, easier to house, um, you know, who have been on the street for for a shorter time. You know all the issues I'm talking about, but that's the, the five years, Maggie. Sure. Um, thanks for that question, Commissioner Parent. You know, it is always the the burning question, right? Of should we lower this bar on um, eligibility for our yeah. homeless programs? And what I will say is we currently don't have enough resources to even serve the people that are currently eligible under this criteria. So I'm not sure what the value would be in broadening the criteria. Meaning the resources system. in terms of things like transitional housing and coming Correct. to the other side. Yeah. Correct. Um, yeah. And so I think broadening the criteria without additional resources, I don't think will be of value to anyone. I think all that will happen is the uh, folks who are easier to serve uh, will take advantage of those resources versus, again, us really being able to, um, I don't want to say force the hands, but to, to really ask the agencies and require the agencies to focus on those people um, that have traditionally been left out of the service system. Yeah. It's it's a hard one. I don't I don't just yeah. That's it. That's my that's my question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Sloan. Yes. Uh, so, uh, piggybacking on that, it's a great presentation. Is that if we're looking at the people that have been homeless longer term in Santa Monica, should we? Is and this is my first round with these grants are we focused on the service you know providing the services funding the service providers that are providing services for those longer term homeless people versus somebody who you know is uh easier to house gets into 
um, transitional housing and you know gets a job and things like that. So are we matching up the types of services we're providing based on the eligibility criteria? Yes, that yeah, will be part so. of the scoring rubric, but we will be looking at whether or not their budget, their staff, their qualifications of their staff uh, match the types of target population that they're proposing to serve. So that is part of what we look at when we look at the scoring. Yeah, right. I was just going to say something similar to that, that we asked them to describe how their programs meet the needs of the target population. So that would be something that would be explicitly um, communicated in the program plan. Okay, and it's focused on, you know, the uh, what appears to be the harder, harder to house, harder to, you know, serve people. And, you know, here on the committee uh, commission, we've had a lot of meetings around mental health and uh, you know, there's a lack of mental health um, services available. And so I just want to make sure that if we're going to, you know, be doling out the money again, you know, creating uh, the, uh, that they're going to be serving the population segment that is, we've targeted is eligible or pr preferred. Mm -hmm. And we'll be um, coming back, our division will be coming back next month to talk specifically about outcomes and what we want to see in terms of the impact of the programs that we fund. So that will be, I think, a really key part of that. Oh, good. Next okay, month. great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Vice Chair Sedgeville. Hello. Uh, first off, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I have a couple questions, and if you've already answered some of them, I, I apologize. Um, in the current grant process, um, what would you what would you consider kind of the? Um, and I have one of the documents. Of, what would you consider kind of the current percentage of uh, of buckets for homelessness? Um, I don't know if this is a question for this one, but homelessness. Um, child care uh, and job services. Is that an appropriate question for this for this conversation or? That's a great Are question you? that I don't know if we have the exact answer to, but we can, yeah. unless I can punt that to my colleague, Mark, but that's a good, you're, you're curious what allocation of funding of the total pot goes to the different activities bucketed yeah, by yeah, like mental health. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Um, that's a great question. I don't know, Mark, if you have a gauge of that off the top of your head. Um, and if we don't have that, we can certainly have that information at our next presentation. But I'll just see if I'll check with Mark really quickly and see if he has any insight. Um, I'm here, Liz. Thank you. Um, no, we, we don't have a breakout. We don't typically structure the RFP around bucketing funding for specific service areas. Rather, the applications come in and uh, the review panels make decisions on funding the programs, which are seen as being the most impactful for the priorities identified. So there's not a, a carve out of funding for specific services. Um, and if we wanted to organize our portfolio that way and, and present that back to you, that's something we would need to have. All right, thank you, Mark. <laughs> yeah, I was just curious, if the city seems to have, seems to structure their, their, um, their goals around that. I was wondering if it applies to the grants program as well. Um, next question, I was, I was intrigued, and once again, if this is the wrong time, by all means, slap me um, verbally. Um, when it comes to the funding, someone, there was a suggestion of pilot programs. Uh, maybe this is under participant eligibility or applicant eligibility, um, in which using, using some funding for kind of more flexible um, programs. What are some examples that you're thinking of? I think we'd be thinking of like, for example, um, a program that was, um, you know, hadn't operated in Santa Monica and was planning to or looking to expand into Santa Monica or perhaps a program that um, was still gathering data in terms of effectiveness, but showed really promising results that maybe either a new or established agency would want to um, 
launch in Santa Monica. Um, and really, we're asking agencies to bring their best thinking to the table, and we and that's why we have um, the review panel comprised of subject matter experts, so that we're really getting, you know, no matter if we do a carve out or not, that we're really getting um, the best thinking and the best high quality programs for um, for our residents, our vulnerable residents. So, so a UBI type program could be considered as kind of one of these kind of smaller loans or something something where um, whether it's a behavioral health center or some incredibly unique program that's happening um, in another portion of the state or another city that Santa Monica wants to, in the middle of the grants program, try to fund and replicate uh, to see how it works. That's, that's, a, that's a type of program you guys are envisioning. That could be, um, that could definitely be a kind of program and there's nothing necessarily that would exclude a program like that with the criteria that we laid out tonight, as long as they were able to speak to the components of the proposed scoring criteria that we listed. Um, a new program like that wouldn't be in ineligible under those criteria. You said it would be ineligible or? There, there wouldn't, sorry. <laughs> There's no reason that a program like that would not be eligible under the criteria that we laid out tonight, as long as it um, could speak to the uh, the scoring and eligibility criteria that we laid out tonight. So there's nothing prohibiting that kind of program from applying under the criteria we laid out tonight. All right, thank you. Um, all right, and I have one other question I probably have several later um, but under the attachment C program scoring component possible points um, uh, target population described plan for managing waste lists is that wait list or waste list that should be wait, wait list, list. Sorry. Uh, thanks for I catching was, that <laughs> I was completely I was like this I was like this is this is I've gained some weight this is offensive but um, I was like curious because I was like, all right, I don't know what that means. All right, that works. I like the, uh, for the most part, I like the scoring criteria. Right, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I do have a bunch of questions. So, so there are no different categories. It's not like we're looking for grants uh, in, you know, mental health, substance abuse, uh, you know, the whole long list of, of what comprises human services. There's not like we're looking for three providers and You'll see, I, I think a little bit of that is spelled out in the expectations and kind of the values of what we're looking for. And then you'll see a lot more of that in detail when the outcomes are presented. So the outcomes really speak to uh, the activities are expected to render something. And that's where we talk about, you know, if it's a mental health activity, where it's supposed to render increased mental health, you know, uh, satisfaction. Or but it's not anything. like of the $8 million, we want to make sure that at least $2 million is being spent on mental health. We, it's not currently um, structured that way in an attempt to not really pigeonhole ourselves into a, a setting forth the expectations. And so we can see what is proposed and then weigh that against um, the needs in the community. And then the panel of experts that will be reviewing all the proposals um, would have the opportunity to make a recommendation to how many of the mental health organizations that applied are recommended for funding and how many of the homeless organizations that applied are recommended for funding. So it's really, uh, rather than having an expectation set of how much funding would be available to each different um, activity, it's to allow the proposals to come in and then to evaluate against all I mean, the proposals. You could, you could easily spend $8 million to address the needs of this community on just homelessness. Yeah, right. Easily. Yes. Or twice that yes. on just that piece of it. So then it comes to the question of the dollar amount and the 8 million. And that was the current amount you had said. And, and, and you're just a sort of assuming at this point that that's going to be your budget going forward for the next four years. Yes, it, that'll be finalized during the budget study session at city council. Yeah. So but I mean, we're assuming it'll be a similar amount. I mean, I'll just say that's like a ridiculously low amount of money. And I yeah. think so many of the issues that this uh, commission is, uh, you know, that come to this commission and the issues that we're all dealing with in this community in every way is because we're just spending a tiny, tiny fraction of what's needed on, on to address these issues. And so, 
you know, for better or for worse, it's great to see all the thought you're giving to applicant eligibility, participant eligibility, scoring criteria. But if it's only like, it's like literally we're rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. You know, it's like we're talking about how do we qualify the distribution of such a tiny amount of money given the enormity of the need. And so I, mm -hmm. I just don't mean to in any way diminish the importance of the work you're doing or the value of the work you're doing, but it just feels like we're spending a lot of time on this piece of it. And the real issue is how much money do we have? And I'm not arguing that- Yeah, I don't think we would that. disagree with yeah. the- Yeah, I just uh, want to bring of... it to the, ter to the attention of the commission because I think that from my point of view, that's what I want to focus on. Mm -hmm. And all these things I think are, are worthwhile, but I really do trust staff that you've given a lot of good thought to how to define eligibility for applicants and participants and criteria. And my only concern actually about all of it is that we're spending too much time on it, not just because I think that the dollars is really what matters, but um, you know, when you get down to it, it's really does become a barrier for a lot of applicants when you have a very, very uh, detailed application. Uh, you know, I don't know how many pages this application will be. I mean, can you say roughly, is it like 10 pages? Is it 20 pages? Is it, you know, like when somebody submits a response to this application, how many pages will that that response be? I, I'm not sure the final number, probably ranging between like 10 and 15 pages, I would imagine. Okay, because I mean, you know, I just feel like that's a cost to all of these organizations. And, you know, really the bottom line is how much money do we have to deliver to the community versus, you know, cover administrative costs. And, you know, I'm always somebody who places value on the service delivery piece of it. And I know all of you do as well. I think we all share those, cost, those, those concerns. And so I really feel like I'd like to make these applications easier rather than harder. And you know, going back to your question about applicant eligibility, um, you know, I think it should not be hard for everybody to apply, not just smaller organizations, but for everyone. And there shouldn't be two tiers. There shouldn't be a lot of barriers to applying for this kind of funding. And it's not to say that you know you don't have to show qualifications, but you know, if somebody has a 990, if somebody has you know a lot of the other documents that you need to create, and you know. Certainly, if you've been working with them for years and you understand what they do, um, which I envision most of the applicants will be, a lot of the applicants are going to be organizations that you already know. Like, let's not make this a hugely intense process. Let's make this as, as streamlined and as efficient and as easy as possible. So I just feel like that should be the bigger overriding focus. You know, how do we reduce barriers for all applicants? Mm -hmm. And and just one other point, um, you know, I don't know if this is the right way to look at it, but when you were saying you have $8 million and roughly 20 agencies, I'm sure it isn't 400,000 per agency. I mean, that would just be, you know, a very simplistic way of looking at it because some have multiple programs, but let's just use the assumption, say $400,000 per agency. So I, I, I don't know if that's way off that bound. Let's just say it, it could be a good way of looking at it. And so then for four years, so it's $1.6 million per agency roughly um, who's applying. Um, now, are there cost escalations within those, within those applications? I mean, you can't expect somebody four years from now to have the same costs that they have today. And certainly I'm sure you've been finding that a lot of your providers are in big trouble right now, continuing to provide services to the city based on contracts that, you, that they agreed to years ago, right? I mean, this is happening all over mm -hmm. LA. So I just- Yeah, there are cost of living increases. And we also look at the contracts annually and adjust the budgets um, to make sure that it's, you know, been divided up appropriately. And that if there's increasing costs in one area, we can work with the agencies to adjust their budget so that it's appropriately meeting um, so that allows them to meet the program goals and also allows them to meet any emerging needs that may come out um, after they've already been awarded. So we have we have that that mechanism in place um, as well. That's great to hear. But I guess is, is the four hundred thousand dollars per agency a good number, or is that way off base? It's um, not. I wouldn't say it's totally off base, but there's um, more. It's not that evenly divided. No. Right. 
No, I'm sure you're right. Um, but is that also the right way to look at it? So, so it's like 1.6 million is really kind of, if, if, if we're using 400,000, then, then that would be the way to look at it because really you're agreeing to four years upfront. You are agreeing to four years up front. Yeah. Some agencies okay. are funded beyond 1.6 million and some are funded yeah, uh, far, less. far less than that. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that is, that is a good deal of money. And I, I do appreciate that you do want to be, you know, thoughtful about, you know, all these eligibility criteria, but I guess I just want to go back to the point that, um, you know, there's a huge cost to these organizations to apply for these funds and the, the more you can do to streamline the process and to reduce the paper that they need to create and to, you know, reduce the barriers to, uh, to, to, to new organizations or, or smaller organizations applying. I, I think that that's the right way to go. Last comment was simply um, just two small points. One is 12 board members. What does that matter? Like, why is that even important? How many board members an organization has as a criterion? Yeah. This has been something we've discussed quite a bit, actually, and um, I think the thinking behind that is that um, typically, as you guys all know, board members are recruited because they have maybe um, legal skills or um, business administration skills or they're good at fundraising, and we find that um, a larger board um, allows for um, more diverse voices, perhaps people who are underrepresented in the community or consumer voices and allows for more robust dialogue. And our, actually within our current um, portfolio, our average um, board member number is 20. So that far exceeds the 12. So we, we find that just to be um, uh, in line with what, what the reality is for the types of agencies that would be applying for these funds. And that it allows for that kind of really robust um, representation and dialogue with on the, within the board. Okay, and, and that I understand why you, why you say that then. And then the last question, you, you mentioned equity and I just don't know how, how, does, how do you define that? Like whether an organization is addressing equity how, or how they're addressing equity is responsive to your, your request. Mm -hmm. We ask them to submit um, their policies and procedures of how they operationalize equity. We also ask them about cultural competency. Um, we ask them about the composition of their board of directors. Um, Liz, what am I? Um, yeah, I think that it's it, part of our ask beyond the organizational capacity, kind of checking the box around those those um, pieces that Alana just mentioned. Um, there's an opportunity opportunity for them in their narrative and their program plan to explain to us how they're perhaps how their outcomes are targeting um, any equity in their target population that they're serving. So beyond just us asking um, for these kind of organizational capacity points, they there will be an opportunity for them to showcase to to the scores of the um, proposals how they operationalize equity in their activities. Got it. Okay. That all that all makes sense. Well I really appreciate um, again, everything you're you're doing to to make this equitable for for the applicants and and as as simple as possible. And um, certainly, I'm going to be advocating for a lot more money than eight million because I feel like we're never going to make any progress as a community uh, on a budget like this. Um, anyway, any any other further comments by any members of the commission? Yeah, I, I, have, I have I have follow up. Okay, Bill. Um, so this is following up on this, and it, you know the the um, vulnerable populations and the peace. And I'm just thinking this through and, and this is kind of hypothetical, but um, so so let's say name names, um, but there's a there's a, 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 a an organization that specializes in drug and alcohol rehab. That's what that's what they do. Um, they've been they've, they've, they've been reputable and they've done a great job and we have paid, you know, for a portion of of of, of their work and it's all likelihood they will reapply and and for at least that basic work. Now we have a something different since 2015 is that we have um, a problem of, of you know methamphetamine it's connected to low level crime, high addiction. These are these are young people who have certain transients and 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 all of this. If that nonprofit were to say, you know, number one, 
here's here's our application for our basic thing but we want to do something we we, we want to make a couple of hires and develop a program that is really designed to to get these kids um and and uh, on meth and get them get get them um early as we can into a program now you know that well, well, well number one to, to, you know it's encouraging organizations to also submit an innovative program in terms of their regular programming and other you know the, uh, pilot ideas is that is is that something that will be considered and number two is what I just described no we can't do it because it's you know that that's not the profile who's been here chronically homeless for five years um that's not the profile of of the 19 year old new meth addict um I think the short answer to your question is yes they should apply for the, for funds with that innovative new program idea even though it's not the same program that they've been funded for right. historically so they should certainly um, under the current RFP, the way that it's right now, um, we would welcome a new approach to the new issues of our time. And they um, wouldn't be competing against themselves necessarily. No, they wouldn't be competing against themselves. They would. They can apply and detail the range of programs that they present to meet the range of needs that they've identified and can show with evidence and research that proves that that target population is in our community. Um, so it would be certainly, um, yes, this would be an opportunity for, for, for funding for a program like that. Um, so your second question was and the, I just, the eligibility, yeah, the eligibility. Yeah, they would still have to their target population or serving, um, their clients with HSGP funds would have to meet what according to our current eligibility as we've written it as we're now soliciting feedback though so that it's as i want to reiterate this is a draft um right. they would if it was written as it is now they would have to detail um that they would target the population as eligible in the way that we have it written now okay and, and so so i, I guess wanted to so, so oh. trying to trying to trying to figure out how to have uh you know to allow some innovation on the side, especially with well, vulnerable populations that don't quite match that. that that's, mm -hmm. that's, I guess that's the point. Remind, I just wanted I just to remind well, folks well, that well. this is not all of the funding that serves this community. This right. is the city funding is a very small portion of the money the agencies have in their operating budgets. So I think what we are trying to do is really create um, a reasonable pool of eligible participants that can be served with the limited dollars we have versus trying to serve everybody because the agencies already have funding. If they wanted to do an innovative program, you know, commissioner parent that served this particular target population, they could probably use their existing funding to do that. Um, I think what we are trying to do is match city dollars to what the what we see every day on our, you know, in our community as the need. Yeah. Okay. And I can, can you all hear me still? Yeah. Um, just small um, additional thought is that somebody who is like a somewhat, for example, a youth, um, if they were, even if they're not falling under the participant eligibility for people experiencing homelessness, they may be eligible because, for example, they went to a Santa Monica public school or then have continued ties to the city. So just be, somebody could be experiencing homelessness and fall into that, that other um, SMPP category as well. So there, it's not a completely cut and dry that only people experiencing homelessness would fall only within the, um, the categories of SMPP for people experiencing homelessness, if that makes sense. Yes, great, thanks. Yeah, that, that yeah, does right. make sense. That's, that's, that's yeah. simple. Okay, great. Well, um, oh, uh, is Chair Stutchdown? Oh, yeah. One other, one other follow-up question. First off, I just want to agree with the Chair. We want you guys to have a lot more money. 
um, much more money for the grants, human grants program, because I think the last funding, it's the same funding from, I think, 2015, and inflation has gone up. Um, one question on, and I'd asked a question about the, the buckets, and I know that there's, there is, uh, Maggie had mentioned that the departments have additional funding, and this is only 8 million for a very limited group. <clears throat> so I had brought up, um, you know, if the past grants has any, any kind of like breakdown percentage of groups, whether like 25% is going to focus on homelessness, 25% is going to focus on childcare, 25% is for innovation or something like that. Is the reason there's no buckets or no specific criteria that you're looking for to, to cast as wide net as possible to make sure that anyone with an incredible program can apply and get the opportunity to receive money in Santa Monica? Or is it, or is it that there is no kind of, there's no real, there's no, there's no guidance on, on what the grants program should be funding um, from the council, from the city council. It's not, and it's absolutely not a knock on the city council. I'm just kind of curious what, what the reasoning is. I think primarily it's to your first point that it's to allow us to receive the applications that we receive and to be able to fund the ones that are um, most convincing in terms of the impact they're going to provide and have the strongest track record, um, regardless of what specific kind of program it is. Um, and I'll I'll open it up to the administrators to see if if you want to add anything in terms of additional context of why that has been the case in the past. Yeah, I'll jump in. I think um, this is Maggie. I think it's uh, to the very point that's been raised a lot about, you know, looking for new best practices, looking for innovation. I think because the grants program, program um, is sort of stuck in this bucket of existing funding, I think if we were to try to be specific about how much can go to any one subpopulation or any one type of service, it would um, be a disincentive for new agencies to apply, right? If, if they knew there was only a million dollars for homeless programs, you know, new agencies wouldn't go through the effort of applying knowing that there's already $2 million, you know, in existing programming to existing agencies uh, under that bucket. So I think we don't want to box ourselves in. Let's see what we get in. And then I think it will be the hard work of um, the review panel <laughs> to really kind of suss this out, look at it holistically and uh, make recommendations. Just so there is the potential, like the review panel comes in, there's several outstanding um, uh, applicants and all the 8 million goes to homeless services and we lose money for child care or or any other of the uh, grants that are currently with meals on wheels and stuff like that it will ultimately be up to council to make the final awards uh and and so i don't think it is helpful for us to speculate um you know and i think we are here to hear your feedback and your input and if you all want to make a recommendation that there should be minimum minimum funding amounts to certain things, uh, we would be happy to take that feedback from you. Thank you. And also uh, just to add that the review panel would be, we would recommend that the review panel have balanced representation from the different um, subject areas that we would be funding through the RFP. So there would be representation from homeless services, there would be representation from child care, there would be representation from youth and family from employment. So we would want to have that balanced um, representation and advocate advocates for the different types of programs. Okay, well, uh, thank you again. Um, on behalf of uh, the commission, we really appreciate it. We look forward to um, continuing the discussion at our next meeting on March 28th. And um, now moving on to item number two, we have a lot after this item as well uh, to cover in tonight's meeting. So um, 
This, will, uh, this is a public hearing discussion and possible action to inform development of the draft fiscal year 20 to 2022 to 23 action plan, which proposes activities for use of community development block grant, the CDBG, and home investment partnership funding, implementing the 2020 to 2024 consolidated plan. That was a mouthful. I hope you have this in front of you to read. Um, uh, there will be a presentation by uh, Mark Amaral um, from the Housing and Human Services Division. Mark. Hi there, Winnie. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Mark Amaral. I am a fiscal administrator with the Housing and Human Services Division within the city's Community Services Department. And I am here tonight uh, to present an early version of our proposed 22-23 uh, CDBG Home Action Plan. Uh, an annual action plan is the annual instantiation of the implementation of our five-year consolidated plan. Uh, currently, our, we are within the going into the third year of the 2020-24 consolidated plan. Uh, you have within your agenda packets a uh, nice two-page summary of both uh, the priority areas identified in the consolidated plan, our progress on con plan goals to date, as well as the projects proposed uh, for the upcoming year three of the, the current plan. Um, I am, in the interest of time and unless the commission directs, I am not going to spend a lot of time going through the details of our progress to date on the consolidated plan, other than to say that we are well on target um, to meet our goals in all priority areas. Um, in, in the first year of the plan, we did not focus uh, any funding on public infrastructure and that was because we were prioritized emergency rental assistance uh, due to the economic impacts of COVID-19. Moving forward in the next few years, I think we will see a substantial focus on those areas. Um, we have that in this current year um, with approved funding for the VAP Community Kitchen um, and improvements at uh, Virginia Avenue Park and Gundaric Park. And our current proposed plan for 22-23 features an additional emphasis on capital projects. Um, so I'll begin there. Uh, we are projecting to have just about $1.3 million um, in available CDBG funding for next year. We don't currently know for certain that that is our final amount as HUD has not yet announced uh, formal allocations. But uh, in the past, it's been a, a good practice to assume that funding will be flat. And indeed, usually it remains flat or occasionally increases by a small percentage. So know that for now, our assumption is flat funding. Um, would it increase? Um, we may be able to entertain increases to these current projects or potentially wholly new projects that are not contemplated within uh, the current proposal. But I wanted to walk the commission and the community through those proposed projects. Uh, first and foremost, and it would be a substantial investment in the Felmetary building at Virginia Avenue Park uh, with nearly $500,000 worth of public infrastructure improvements. Um, as many of you will know, that is the building that will house the future VAP community kitchen. And we are already contributing uh, nearly $600,000 in CDBG funding to build that out. Uh, the rationale here is that the, uh, the building will become a hosting space um, for the community moving forward. And we want uh, that building to match all the development that's going on in that kitchen so that the, uh, the center itself uh, it pairs well with the kitchen and is a functional representation and, and functioning uh, facility for the for the city and in the community to use. Um, next up is some substantial improvements to the VAP Teen Center Courtyard. Uh, the courtyard has been experiencing drainage issues for, for many years, um, as well as issues with uh, glaring sun um, and a lot of heat in the afternoons. So some of these improvements here would be to repair those drainage issues and to figure out a shading solution that would allow the courtyard uh, to be used adequately uh, in the afternoon hours. And uh, moving on to uh, the VAP Fitness Center room improvements. Sorry, the VAP Fitness Room improvements. The Fitness Center is a different facility. Uh, within the Fitness Room itself, uh, there are some substantial problems with the flooring. Um, and the proposal here is to use CDBG funding to update the flooring and uh, any other minor components of that room so that it can be continued to be used safely by the community. And then at Gandhara Park, uh, proposal here is for replacement of the basketball courts, um, which have long needed replacement. Um, and so as, particularly as we emerge from COVID, 
uh, making sure that these public spaces that are highly utilized, uh, particularly in the summer months, are in good, in good shape for safe use by the community. Uh, that completes the, the capital portion of our proposed CDBG projects. Uh, moving from there, we have our home access program, which is a program offered by the Disability Community Resource Center, also a grantee of the Human Services Grants Program. This program provides minor home modifications that allow people with disabilities to remain in their homes. Uh, employment services offered by Chrysalis, also an HSGP grantee. Uh, the Santa Monica Retention Program uh, offered by the St. Joseph Center, also through the HSGP, and General Community Legal Services uh, offered by the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles, also through the HSGP. Um, the, uh, the latter four programs that I just mentioned, being all HSGP grantees, uh, allow for CDBG to be a uh, nice complement to the substantial amount of general funding that we already use for the grants program and well utilize the public services limitation on CDB fu CDBG funds, of which we are limited to 15% in available funding annually. Uh, continuing, uh, there is a 20% allocation for CDBG administration in line with HUD regulation. Uh, and there I'll stop for a second and say those are all of the proposed projects to be funded with CDBG dollars. Uh, separately from CDBG is home funding, uh, for which we project a little under $700,000 to be available. Uh, here, as, as we do annually, we'll continue to use uh, the vast majority of home funding for tenant-based rental assistance vouchers for vulnerable populations. Um, there is a, an allowance there as well for home administration. And there's typically a HUD requirement for a CHODO reserve, which is a community housing development organization. Um, now the nature of these organizations is that there are not a lot of opportunities to spend this kind of money on uh, functional projects within Santa Monica. Um, and occasionally that funding has had to be returned. In recent years, HUD has started to be much more flexible uh, with this requirement and even waive the requirement in recent years. And should they do so again in the coming year, which we hope, uh, that $91,000 will be reallocated to either TBRA or home administration, um, depending on the details of any waiver that HUD issues. Uh, these proposed projects uh, will be uh, put out for another public review, either to this commission in late March or to the Virginia Avenue Park Advisory Board in mid-March. in mid -March. Um, and from there, we'll have a complete draft action plan. We posted for a 30-day public review and comment period before the, the completed plan uh, heads to council for approval on April 26th. Uh, assuming approval on April 26th, the plan will be submitted to HUD by the current deadline of May 15th um, and implemented beginning July 1st of the next fiscal year. Uh, that concludes my short presentation. I have room for any questions uh, any members of the the commission have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, in this case, I'll just let um, commissioners raise their hand if they have any questions or comments. Actually, oh, you know, Commissioner Perrin, I see you, but I, oh. I made a mistake. I was supposed to first ask for public comment. I apologize. Let me first ask if there's any public comment. I just wanted to say that we received one written public comment on this item and it's posted on the commission's website. Okay, thank you very much. And then uh, commissioner comments or questions, uh, Commissioner Perrin. I just wanted to thank Mark for, that was a, just a, Great summary, all the facts. I, you know, you had to get it all out and uh, you did. And congratulations on uh, being ahead on all of your metrics. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments of Commissioner Vice Chair Stretchow? Hi, Mark. Great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, Tenant-based rental assistance. Um, you may have gone through this, but what does that entail and how do you qualify? 
The TBRA program is administered by the housing unit within the Housing and Human Services Division. Um, and it's prioritized for seniors and persons living with disabilities and at risk of losing their housing in Santa Monica because they are paying more than 40% of their income uh, towards rent. Thank you. Okay. Um, no, no other questions from any commissioners? And um, well, thank you so much, Mark. That was really very thank you helpful. For having me. I mean, I think I think as um, as 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 has been said, uh, this is very straightforward and concise, and it looks like you're right on target. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me tonight. Okay, great. Um, moving on to item number three on our agenda. It's a continuation of the of the discussion that we had from our special meeting on um, March seventh, relating to. Um, uh, the community benefits and Providence St. John's development agreement with the city of Santa Monica. Um, and um, at that presentation, um, the commissioners asked two questions of uh, Providence St. John regarding um, uh, their, their grant program, their community grants program, and to what extent what's been um, offered as part of the community benefits is uh, a lot more substantive than what they already are doing as part of their typical course of business. And then also um, uh, some comments to help to ask, asking to, to justify the $10 million since um, this commission had made requests about psych beds and so many other benefits that are not being addressed in the uh, current proposal. And also the $10 million that is on the table um, uh, it was questioned as to whether or not that was uh, you know, where that number came from and, and why why only 10 million, given the needs of this community and given um, the value that's provided as part of this uh, development agreement. Uh, a letter was received um, from Providence St. John in response to our questions, uh, it's posted on our website uh, earlier today. And um, so it is available to the public and can be seen uh, by anyone who's interested um uh we all just received it today or i just received it today as well and um uh that letter uh was responsive uh, to a certain degree to the questions we asked but for me personally it didn't help justify um or change my point of view let's put it that way um and at this point i think um what's before us um is uh whether there's an interest in further discussing the question of the community benefits package among the commissioners, and also whether we wanna make a uh, recommendation to council about, um, about the community benefits package. I believe council is going to be making a decision about the Providence St. John um, uh, development agreement uh, on March 22nd. So uh, Commissioner Parent. I, I haven't. I, I might have missed the email. I, I haven't seen that letter. Could, could we post that letter in the chat? Is there a, is that a possibility if it's if it's out? Where where is that? Or where you know? Okay, yeah, it was I think sent uh, to us. Um, we, we can't really we can't respond without that at least hearing their answers. Or okay, um, so it is posted on the website and. You did receive a copy, or you should have received a copy. It was addressed to all the commissioners um, in your Santa Monica. Oh, estimate. in the Santa Monica mail. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know about posting in chat. And I guess no, I that's guess, okay. I'll find it in the website. Go ahead. I don't. I don't mind posting it in the chat, but I, I just don't know about all these rules. <laughs> about chat government. is actually disabled for this meeting. We we disabled okay. chat for commission meetings. Okay. But the letter is at smgov.net forward slash ssc and it's under today's date. Any any comments or is there any statements that anybody wants to make? Um, we do have an ad hoc uh, on the development agreement 
uh, the members of that ad hoc. I don't know if you have something special you want to, if you've if you've had, if you've done any more thinking on this issue or have come up with any suggested points of view. Um, I can I can jump in. I think I I think I think most of the commission was in kind of or maybe I may have mis misunderstood, but I thought most of the commission was in somewhat support of asking for more money up to twenty million. Um, I know we were pushing for that, um, which I I think. I think Providence St. John's needs, I think they've done a lot of good in the community. They're going to continue to do a lot in the community, but um, the community needs psych beds. And, and I think it was demonstrated that we, psych beds will be very, very expensive, um, which is fine. It's difficult to ask one provider to, to fund a very expensive program, but they can still, if they're if they're unwilling to provide the psych beds, then they should start the ball rolling um, with a substantial uh, cash payment to help to help kind of push everybody else to add in to develop psych beds. Um, I think ten millions. I think ten millions way too small. Um, and what what the what we could do is we can take kind of comments from the commission, uh, draft uh, a letter in response. Um, we could then discuss having an, a kind of a special meeting right before the city council to approve the letter. And as a commission, um, send the letter to, to council. I think given the timing, that will be necessary to have a special meeting to approve the letter unless we wanted to come up uh, as a group right here with general um, points that we agree on being made in the letter and then just delegate um, to the ad hoc, uh, the drafting of the letter and basically say that we were happy to um, defer to the ad hoc to um, draft and send the letter to council without one more time going past uh, all the members for approval, basically giving pre-approval. But yeah, if we want to discuss the letter, we would have to call a special meeting. So, hey. for, yeah, no. I, I, I think I like the strategy of a letter, but I hate to give up, you know, a, 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 full, a vote of the full board is so much more powerful than a letter from an ad hoc. Um, it's just a, it's just a very, very different message. Um, and, um, so I'd, I'd, I'd go, I'd go for the, for the quick special meeting. Uh, okay. Cause it's a very, it's a really, it's a, it's a, it's an important thing. Okay. I, I'm, I'm totally, uh, should we, should we make a motion to, um, uh, uh ask the, um, ad hoc to, uh, help draft a letter to um, council uh, advocating for uh, increased funds from those that they've proposed in their development agreement. Is, is there anything else besides increased funds? We had a list of, I think like 10 demands. I think the um, Providence St. John's did an excellent job. They read the letter, they had responses. But that doesn't mean we don't have to ask or just re remind council that hey, here's a list of other things. So, is there anything else that you would like to see in the draft letter? And if it's if it gets taken out during the meeting, it gets taken out. But what else? What else could we add? Bill, I, I I'd, I'd like to uh, advocate for. Have keeping the stress whether or not it works or not on the psych beds because I think it's a public education um, issue. And but 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 by the way, you know, Providence St. John's, 
um, I, 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 went, I did this internet tour of all their hospitals. They have neuropsych units in a lot of their hospitals in Southern California and across the country. And they even brag about it as community benefit. And I can't believe that they're paying, you know, what they say it's costing to do. Um, you know, so I, 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 I'd, I'd advocate for that that remains the most prominent um, and important um, uh, Item. And I also think it's the one um, that there's a number of members of, of, of city council who uh, see mental health issues on the street and feel the same way. Um, this is Cindy. Yes. Um, you know, as a practitioner, I, I'm a little torn on this one because, of course, you know, there's people waiting for beds right now, sitting in emergency rooms on bed search to get to an actual um, inpatient unit where they're gonna get treatment. Um, but I do feel like there's this perception that we send people away somewhere and they're gonna get fixed. And so many people, you know, get discharged right back to the same environment and the same issues continue. So I, I'm i sort of more toward advocating for, you know, the, uh, the other kind of services, follow up aftercare, linkage to, you know, other services, social support, um, you know, homelessness prevention. Um, I just, I, so many people come to my hospital, they're just like, oh, can you just, you know, my son's doing this, you gotta take him, you gotta hospitalize him, but it's really, that's not what really is called for in that instance. And I'm just am concerned about continuing that perception. I think that's a misperception that that's um, always what is needed. So just putting that out there. Okay. Any other comments or thoughts? Um, well, I think this ad hoc, is it Cindy and uh, Brian? Yep. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, um, uh, in terms of drafting a letter, uh, do you think the two of you are able to do that? I'm more than happy to help with that. And I'm happy to help with that too. Yeah, we can, oh, we'll always take the help, but uh, yeah, absolutely. And then we can, uh, we can come back for a special meeting and uh, uh, make edits, changes, and then shoot it off. Okay, I'm looking here at, at our, um, who's attending and we do have a member of the public who's requested um, the opportunity to, to speak, uh, Nancy Coleman. Yes, thank you, Wendy, and thank you, um, Commission. I think it's really important that the ad hoc committee also, as they look at this, see that there are two pots of money. One is the pot of money that they've set aside for mental health. And the second amount is the amount that they will supplement what you talked about earlier, which is your grants program. And I think that, that both need to be asked for more money. It's not simply one or the other. And that, um, Brian, in your um, statement earlier about innovation and outside groups, it, uh, it, that money could be used in a manner that is much more innovative than simply tying it to the current grant grantees. So I think that it's important to state that when you do the comment. The other elements I think are really important um, that, that you go back to the eight or nine points that were made in that, uh, uh, that we originally had, because again, it's a historical perspective. And these are things that we really want um, that the Social Services Committee had stated that they wanted to have as goals for any development agreement. And this is the most, this is the largest one that we'll have. Um, there is some discussion going on that is subsequent um, to the discussion that you had last month with Michael Ricks. Um, on an agreement um, 
with other hospitals in the area, other health systems in the area to possibly fund a, a center similar to one that's in Orange County at a higher percentage of dollars from, um, from St. John's, money from UCLA, money from Kaiser and money from Cedars. So I think that there's some, that the challenge that, um, that Sean Landris made at the Planning Commission, the challenge that was made at the Social Services Commission is really pushing um, Michael Ricks in a direction to have those collaborative um, discussions. So I think that that your and your commission and your and the work with Stacy has really promoted that. Ms. Stacy Douglas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, uh, any any motion that we want to put on the table here, or should we just simply ask the ad hoc committee um, to move forward with uh, drafting a letter, and that we will then reconvene? Um, I think we would like to, we should be doing it um, if today is um, the twenty eighth. I'd say uh, the 14th. Or certainly that week. So March 15th. 15th is fine. We can do it, you know, earlier in the e in the evening or end of the day. I think we have the opportunity to do it whenever we want to do it. Is Tuesday, March 15th a good day for those on the... Oh, whoops. We definitely need to get a quorum. So it's oh. important that we choose a time that works for everyone. Sorry, I'm... March okay. 15th, March 14th, any time that week. Um... Okay, Any, anybody on the call have any problems with March 14th or 15th? The city council meets on 15th, so you may. Okay, that's a good point. I much prefer the 14th as well. Okay. Let's do it the 14th. Let's, you wanna say, um, uh, do you wanna do it late afternoon or do you wanna do it at this time? Uh, I can't do it until about five, after 5.30. Well, we can just do it at this time. Just do it at seven, yeah. Okay, so Monday, March 14th at seven o'clock, we will have a special meeting to um, review the draft letter. Okay, so what that means then, since I live in the world of um, commission administration, uh, that means it has to be drafted and posted by the 10th. So does that give you enough time? I think so. Yeah, that works for me. I mean, this is not going to be a long letter, right? This is like a one page. Right. Letter. Yeah. I, I was going to go like 30, 40. Your dissertation. <laughs> really, really detail it. I think, I think the bigger question is, um, Cindy, I think you have a different point of view than Brian. Well, it's more just how it's presented. I mean, I, so I think, yeah, so, but I have time to sort this out my schedule is okay. pretty open the next couple weeks so okay. as long as brian can fit it in and i'm sure Wendy okay. would love your eyes on it as well yeah no i'm i'm happy to to participate so um so i just want to want you to understand though because it has to be public uh posted publicly and often fridays for whatever reason that's not possible to do so it has to be done thursday so um okay so it needs to be posted by the 10th yes okay if we're having a meeting on the 14th. Um, okay, so um, every I don't think we need to vote on this. I think we just need to agree. Um, special meeting on Monday, March 14th at uh, seven o'clock and um, uh, great. Okay. Uh, Moving on, any other comments regarding 
this issue before I move on? Any other thoughts since our last meeting? Okay. Um, going through the ad hoc committees uh, on the budget, nothing to say. Behavioral health. Yeah. Any comments? Future of the Human Services Commissions. This is the. No report. Okay. Social service community benefits, we've just discussed. Universal basic income. No report. Emerging models of shelters and transitional housing. No report yet. We started a conversation though. Okay. I don't, I don't think that, gonna... That's us. Sorry. That's Marie. us? Okay. I do have some little bitty thing to say, if you don't mind, please. Of course. Right after our last meeting, I made an appointment to go visit with uh, the Salvation Army in Santa Monica. They have a, a brand new Lieutenant, James Fleming, who he and his wife started six months ago. And we had a little discussion about homelessness in the city. And I just wanted to let you know that um, they have a lovely sanctuary and a great uh, dining hall. And they, they expressed to me that they would be willing to convert both of those to areas for cots for homeless people um, who needed a temporary place to stay, 23 hours and 59 minutes. And um, I was just surprised at that. And I just wanted to share a, you know, another opportunity that might be available in the city for our homeless population. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Sloan. Um, any other comments? Okay. Um, and um, other public input? And in terms of future agenda planning, aside from the special meeting on the 14th, we have our regularly scheduled meeting on the 28th. And um, at this point, uh, we will be having this follow-up uh, presentation by city staff on the impact of the Human Services Grant Program RFP uh, or the intended impact. And um, are there other items that you want to add to that agenda at this point? Additional agenda items um, can be proposed at our next special meeting as well. So if no one else has, anybody else have any other comments before we close? Okay, I wanna thank everyone for um, participating tonight. You had a wonderful turnout and really wanna pay a special uh, appreciation to city staff. And I know that um, you've invested enormous amounts of time on all these issues that we've been discussing. And um, over the last two years, it's been a particularly difficult time um, with the reduction in staff. And it was great to see that you may be getting uh, one or two more appointments to add to back. So that that's great to hear. And um, certainly I, for one, I'm going to be pushing hard to uh, encourage council to add more to the uh, human services grant uh, program in uh, the next four years. I think it's mandatory. Um, any other further comments by any commissioners? Okay, then I, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.